I'll rise up. I'll rise up for you a thousand times again, each and every one of you. That's what we do here as a community. We continue no matter what. We rise up for each other. Yes? Yes. We rise up for each other. Yes? Yes. Yeah. And we rise up for ourselves. So there's this... Um, it's like a two-sided coin. We can't have one without the other. There are times where we each have to rise up for our own self. Like, I've got to lift myself up. And then there are other times when it's like I'm lifted and I rise up inside my consciousness for, for you and the collective we and all of humanity and everything going on. And so it is um, every day, just as we rise out of bed, we've got to rise up in our consciousness and today what we're going to talk about is we've got to keep going higher and higher into the stratosphere and expand and expand and, and come into new stages of our rocket ships and all the puns and metaphors I can throw at you today. I'll get them all in the first minute. Kidding. But we've got to go beyond where we've been. And so... We're going to talk about ways in which we can break through any kind of barriers of thoughts and beliefs and the consciousness relating to lack. And I know none of y'all have that. And if you don't for yourself, then it's time to expand and go beyond where you've currently been for the collective, because boy, do we need you. All right, so I'm going to bring um, some really key quotes and concepts and things from not only Dr. Ernest Holmes, but Raymond Charles Barker, two of my favorite peeps. I start with Holmes, and he tells you that the power which we are dealing with is a principle and not a personality. Now, for me, what is significant and why I start with this is that what we're dealing with is a principle. That means it works all the time, everywhere, for every single person, sentient being, situation, circumstance, condition, it does not matter, it's not a personality. Do you know, like personality, I have a personality, don't I? <laughs> now, some of you resonate with my personality, and some of you don't, and that's okay. And I have a personality that I resonate with, some of you, and I don't with others. So if this principle were a personality instead of a principle, then it would be like, yeah, Val, good on you. I'm, I'm relating, you got your good. Ah, Linda, mm, not really, not really relating. I have this personality that wah wah with you, so nope. But then I go over, you see what I'm saying? So that's significantly important for us to each understand that this is not a personality, which means it must work all the time. And I'm gonna use this word, as you. I didn't say with you, I said as you. It's a principle, working as you. So that's key point number one, if you're taking notes and wanna keep up today. Then Ernest Holmes talks about this, and I intentionally use the word as instead of with because of this. The only reason a person is limited is that each of us have not allowed the divine that is within each of us to more completely express. We're, we're blocking it, suppressing it, whatever, not letting it all out, right? Our divine individuality, so we are individualized expressions of this divineness, right? Our divine indi individuality compels infinity to appear. I love that. It compels infinity to appear in our experience. And what it's compelling it to do is, is bring it as duality. Because we have believed in duality. Anybody here, you don't have to raise your hand, just inside yourself. 
grew up in a situation, a background, a religion, something that said, God out here, I'm over here. Duality, there's two things going on. It's so ingrained in our culture. It's so ingrained in our backgrounds. It's so ingrained in our own beliefs. And what Holmes is saying is we are experiencing the way that this thing shows up because we have believed in this duality. I'll never forget after my first year of a uh, licensed practitioner, a licensed spiritual coach study, I had a mock panel with some of my um, colleagues at my prior spiritual community. And I did the mock panel. And afterwards, um, I hope Sharon Dunn will hear this at some time somewhere down the road. I'll never forget her because afterwards she said, Karen, I invite you to drop the word with from here on out and pick up the word as. Okay, that was, I don't know, 2009 or something. I've released the word with in my own life unless I'm teaching. And, and when we start out, that's how we learn, to be with something. But I'm encouraging you to pick up the word as. As it. It is moving as us. And I love that our, think of it now, our divine individuality compels infinity to appear and it, its limitlessness in our life from here on out. Does that sound good? Yes. So pick up the word as. So I want to go to, uh, this is important for the topic today. This is all building on the topic today. I want to go back to what could appear to be some basics. So many people walk into this place for the first time. You won't be able to see this on the camera unless Richard goes up, but there's a teaching symbol up there. And it has a V in three sections. And it's similar to what we have here with the person, right? And the little three sections. And we've learned about this a little bit. And so, so the whole foundation of this is that there's this impelling force for good. And this is coming out of a book, the very first chapter. This book called How to Be Healthy, Wealthy, and Happy. Anybody up for that? How to Be Healthy, Wealthy, and Happy by Raymond Charles Barkle. Barker. It's not very thick, but ooh, it packs a great punch. And it's the first chapter. And so he says that there's this impelling force for good. And it is God, spirit, the thing itself, however we choose to call it, right? And it is all and it's through and it's equally distributed in everything. Think of that. It's equally distributed in everything. So that means it includes you. All of it is equally distributed as you, in you. So the little top portion of this teaching symbol, we call it spirit. There's also a lot of other words for it, but we're going to stick to spirit. And this spirit has intelligence and love as its key characteristics. I call it boundless love. So intelligence, infinite intelligence, and boundless love as its key ingredients, right? Its characteristics, spirit. Then in the middle section, some of y'all know this because you've taken classes, yes, foundations. There's soul. We call it soul. And it's a mechanical law. That's its key characteristic, mechanical law. Now, this is a mechanical, as in it never breaks down, y'all. Engine never breaks. It's mechanical, always working. Never ending, always working law. That's its key characteristic. And the third thing is, we know, body, right? Or another word that I like to use so we don't, you know, confuse it with this stuff is matter. So matter. And its key characteristic is form. Okay, so we got spirit, soul, and body. And the reason why this is important is we are each this eternal process of thinking, thinking. So what you think must by its own nature become a form. 
You've probably heard that thoughts are things, yes? A few times? Yes, thank you for participating. <laughs> Raymond Charles Barker says they're not. Thoughts are not things. They cause things. Because there's a soul in the middle. There's a mechanical law. A mechanical law cannot operate without intelligence directing it. So, I'm here to tell you and remind some of you again, you, Y-O-U, you are always the living spirit almighty. You as the living spirit almighty, okay? You are greater than what you appear to be and this divine idea actually projects in every single person. So we got to break the barrier of who we think we are right here and right now. So I have a few things to read from the first chapter of this book. I love it. Spirit. What does he say about spirit? Spirit denotes a universal presence in which you are forever immersed. That's why I use divine oceanic substance. I'm immersed in this and as this divine oceanic substance. It is a presence of intelligence and an action of love. It knows what to do and it wants to do it. If you ever doubt whether you know what to do, tap into as spirit. Infinite intelligence knows what to do and it wants to do it. That's the great news. Spirit indicates a free-flowing, creative, non-repetitive, action in the universe and in each of us. Therefore, in you, there is an eternal uniqueness. In you is a quality which is not in any other living soul. It never has been and never will be. There is something about you that is particular to you. Petra would call us funny bunnies. This something has the power to manage you as an original, unique person, no matter what may be done to make people look alike, act alike, or think alike, it never succeeds. Hasn't succeeded yet, and it's not gonna. Uniformity is utter impossibility. There is a quality in the individual which you can never regiment. Okay, so a reminder, you are always the living spirit almighty, and you are greater than you appear to be. Okay, and, do do good. All right, so the other thing is, he says about spirit, is there's an originating center in the mind of each of us, and that's what spirit is. Not the brain, it's this one mind. It is one with the originating power, which is everywhere evenly distributed, and we call this God. It is an action of the universal mind, which is all knowledgeable, all wisdom, and all intelligence, focalizing itself in and through the individual in a unique and distinct way. This is who you are. So this spiritual uniqueness is the basis of your freedom. You are born in the image and likeness of God. You are born in the image and likeness of a mind that's a big M, mind, which forever differentiates itself, yet never standardizes itself. Whatever the creative power is, it is forever producing new and varied things, yet it never repeats and has never produced two things alike. This is who we are. Here's the key point for you to hear today. When you try to be like anyone else, you forfeit your divine inheritance. If you try to please others by aping the patterns in which they function, you are doomed. Have you ever tried to please others? How's that working out? <laughs> you must be yourself. That is spirit. But what you do with what you are is soul. The way you think, the way you react, the way you adjust is soul. Soul is the subconscious area of mind. You think consciously, but you respond subconsciously. Okay? So here we are in soul. What is your soul? Your soul is that phase of the subconscious which takes your thought, creates an emotional pattern. You hear that? 
emotional pattern to back it up and produces it into a form, matter, body, right? Spirit is where you are. Soul is the way you work. You are the thinker, and when you think, something happens to what you think. Anything with the quality of matter is body. So body is constantly being made new. This is so important to me right now, and I'm sure to some of you. Body is constantly being made new, and it is an ever-renewing process. Every cell within your body is renewing. Every cell is being born every day. Thousands of them die every day. And so God's spirit, none of this is never the same. So we could just give up trying to keep it the same, folks. Because it's always moving and always turning. And last thing from the book here. This science doesn't tell you anything that you are not already doing. None of our teachings actually teach you anything that you're not already doing. It never stops. It only informs you how you're doing it so that you can produce what you want. This teaching does not make you spiritual. There isn't a center or a church in the world that can make you spiritual. If you can be made spiritual, then you aren't spiritual right now. And if you aren't now, you never will be. You are God's image now. Every person in the universe today is the complete operation of God. Every person is a thinking, creative inlet and outlet of God. Every person is a thinking, creative inlet, outlet of the action of infinite mind, infinite spirit, and infinite love. And knowing this, we each get to live accurately with precision, discernment, and specific results. You could say to one idea, no. And to another idea, yes. You select what you would like to have happen, and please reject what you do not want. You are God acting in the midst of this flexible substance, divine oceanic substance, projecting into your experience the ideas of your own mind. Do not worry when forms go out of this world, you can produce more. Worry only when your thinking process and your processes are confused. So you see, this is actually the reason why I brought this in when I'm supposed to be talking about mental equivalence, and I will in just a second, is to understand how this works and who we are. And we're much greater than we ever give ourselves credit for. That we are this divine oceanic substance showing up individually, individualized, and it'll never, ever, ever come around this way again. And it's okay for you to want what you want as long as it doesn't harm anyone or anything else. So let's talk about mental equivalence in a very short order of time. What does he say about that? Well, the, the key is you must have a mental equivalent of the thing that it is that you want to desire. If you don't know what it is, good luck with that. We must have a mental equivalent, that which is equal to what it is we want. And I'm going to remind you, because some people are afraid to say what it is they want. Peter and I have discovered this over the years. It's like, well, but what if I, that's my mental equivalent and I get it and that's not what I want. I want to remind you that the cells in our body are changing and replenishing and renewing every single moment of every single day. So it doesn't matter. Don't be afraid to hold a mental equivalent of something that it is that you want and I mean every single day of your life about anything. Did you wake up this morning and go, this is my mental equivalent of today, Sunday? I didn't. Did you? And I'm talking on the topic. <laughs> I blew it. But I did for this talk right before the talk happened. I had a mental equivalent of how this wanted, wanted to go. It's not yet there because Einstein time needs to stretch a little bit. You see, we can do this to everything, to hold a mental equivalent. 
This is what the master teacher Jesus did every single day. That he was in his ministry for a very short period of time. He said to this paralyzed man, you've heard this story, take up thy bed and walk. Bless you. Jesus knew he said this. When he said this, he knew that man would walk. He knew he'd get up and walk. He not only believed that there was something to respond to him, that universal law, but he knew he had an equivalent of its response. He had that equivalent of man, get up and walk. We would go, wow, that's a miracle. That's a big thing. It was a no thing to him. He's teaching us. This is a no thing. Whatever it is we're holding, it's a no thing. Get up and walk. We have to hold that, right? And, we, and both are necessary. We must have the belief that something's going to respond to this mental equivalent called a law, universal law, and that that mental equivalent is produced. How are we doing? Ernest Holmes says <clears throat> that if we have a real embodiment, then we can demonstrate. So this is the how. This is one of the hows. We must have this, like, embodiment. And I don't know how to help someone know what an embodiment is, but just think of times in your life where every cell in your body, everything, there was no doubt, there was nothing. You just knew. You just knew. You just knew. And then there it was, right? You just knew someone was showing up your house for dinner at 7 p.m. and the doorbell rings at 7 p.m. for dinner. Like, see, I knew it. I knew it. We can also know other things. I just knew I was going to have that accident. And I did. So we have to have an embodiment of it. And Ernest Holmes tells us that we can continuously increase, increase our embodiment. So whatever I can body today, next week, I need to stretch it on something different. It's my stretch zone, and I'm going to embody that. And I'm going to increase the, that which I can embody and know and hold that mental equivalent. And if I can't, sometimes I call my prayer warriors. Hello, I need you to embody this for me right now. And that helps me grow in my embodiment when someone says, oh, yeah, that's easy, of course. Or they give me a new mental equivalent. I had to do that this week three times. And when someone said, well, that happened to me and I, this, this, this happened, I went, oh, I have a new mental equivalent because now I can embody that at a deeper level. You see? Yeah. And then the last thing that I will share that is key to me in holding mental equivalence is faith. And I talk about this a lot. I share this quote a lot, but it's this mental attitude in relationship, let's say, to God's spirit, but it's actually not with, it's as God in spirit. It's this faith as God. Faith in God, but faith as God. Wonder what that faith as God is. Well, it's not my ability of Karen Fry's ability to write a poem. I couldn't do that real well based on past experiences. But the faith as God, I can have faith in a different kind of way in that. And this definition is, is that it's a mental attitude which is so convinced of its own idea, which so completely accepts it, that anything unlike it is impossible and unimaginable. And this is the place that I go all the time so that nothing is left to 
subjective or subconscious stuff and old patterns and old beliefs and this has happened to me before and it's going to happen again. I keep rising up within myself. I want you to rise up right now and rise up within yourself. Whatever it is you're concerned or worried about, that was an invitation. You don't have to take it. But rise up now physically or within yourself and anything you've been thinking about, get that new, thank you Petra and Susan, you can rise up if you want, that means stand up, and within yourself, and anything that you're worried about or concerned about, look at the people around, use this presence, use this force, we're gonna break the barrier, we're gonna go to places we've never gone before, because we've gotta do it not only in our own life, but we must do this for the collective life. We must rise up and anything unlike our mental equivalent for anything in our life that we want, if those thoughts, those ideas, those pasts, those worries, those fears come up, we rise up and say, I have faith as God, right? I have faith as God. I embody that. And anything unlike it is unimaginable unthinkable. I'm not going to place my attention on this anymore. I rise up within myself and call for help. Lifelines. We can break down all of the barriers because we are spirit. We are soul. We are body. And nothing is impossible as God. And so it is.